Hey, everyone. So my name is Saul, um, and I'm here to talk about Polyglot WebAssembly, or exploring composition through the component model. Um, so polyglot is a very overloaded word, like runtimes and other words that we use in computer systems. So I'm going to define what I mean by uh, polyglot later on, so we can have a common base uh, to work on. But first, I'm going to introduce more a bit of myself. So I work at Shopify, um, mainly on the Shopify VM and Wasm Foundations team. Um, so at Shopify, we are building a composable and scalable WebAssembly platform for customizations. That's basically user-defined functions. Um, and on the Wasm Foundation side, we work mostly on open source, and we've been lately doing some work helping um, the Biker Alliance folks move forward some of the tooling around the component model because that's crucial to Shopify's use case. Um, also, we've uh, done some um, experiments with bringing um, dynamic languages to WebAssembly, and the main example of that is, is Javi, which is um, our JavaScript to WebAssembly toolchain, um, and the idea is, is very basic. We compile something like QuickJS into uh, WASM3 to WASI, and then uh, we execute your JavaScript code. Um, so we've also been experimenting with other runtimes, like um, SpiderMonkey, which is Mozilla's um, JavaScript engine. And even though this is heavier and a bit more complex, we think that there is an opportunity here to have faster JavaScript on top of WebAssembly. Um, so we don't have a specific results yet, but we've been working on something really um, exciting, and I'm probably going to do a different talk once we have uh, more information here. So now onto the definition of polyglot. This is not a definition that's mine. It's more like a wrangling of things on the internet until something made sense. Uh, but what I mean by this is multiple programs written in different program languages communicating seamlessly between each other. Um, this picture might be more of what I'm looking for. So you have something written in Rust, and you can easily communicate that program with something written on JavaScript on WebAssembly, and then the same thing with another Rust program. So even though this, this idea is not new, I think it's a very powerful one, and other runtimes have explored to this idea. Uh, the main example that I have for this is Graal VM. So Graal uh, is Oracle's um, VM, which is, is built on top of the on, on top of the JVM, and uses a framework called Truffle to optimize your programs. And the idea is that you can have multiple Im implementations of your programs, like for example, Ruby has, uh, Truffle has Truffle Ruby, and then you can run all those programs on top of the Graal VM, and then they can communicate between each other. So their polyglot characteristic is defined as uh, leverage the best features and libraries of popular programming languages in single apps with no overhead. So that's for the definition of, of polyglot. Um, now, in order to understand why this talk even exists, it's important to give some context on how we use Shopify at, uh, WebAssembly at Shopify. And the best definition for that is this slide. So we use WebAssembly for synchronous ex execution of untrusted code in performance-sensitive contexts. So there are a couple of things that we can extract from this definition. The first one is synchronous execution. We don't allow any side effects um, in our WebAssembly execution. So that means no HTTP, no async, nothing. Uh, that's just pure execution. And the second um, important um, concept here is in performance sensitive context. So you can think of this in a context where delays are not allowed or they should be minimized. So a performance sensitive context or a, a good example of that is uh, a checkout process. If you want to run some customization uh, of some piece of code that a user submitted to your platform, you want to make sure that it's fast and reliable. Um, because if not, that can have some consequences on, on, you know, on the conversion uh, for a specific merchant. Now, I don't want to make this talk Shopify specific, so I've extracted two main characteristics that I think are important for this talk to make, to make sense. And the first one is that we're talking about platforms that have tight execution limits. Uh, you can think of five milliseconds at max. If a user submits a function to your platform that takes longer than this, it's going to get interrupted. So basically, uh, your platform won't be functional for what a user is trying to do. Um, and then the second important characteristic here is we want the smallest binary size possible. So we've been working with sizes of around 256 kilobytes per binary. If someone submits something bigger than this, it won't be able to, we won't be able to, to accept that as a valid program. So 
some of you might ask, okay, why is this size um, constraint so important? And the answer to that is that we want to have highly available modules, right? And the bigger they are, the harder it is to store them, to cache them, to transfer them over the network. Um, and so the, the, the smaller they are, the better. With these ideas in mind, um, it, it seems like the traditional approach of statically linking a single program and running that in your runtime might not be as scalable as we might expect. So it seems like what we want instead is submitting a single uh, binary that requests some functionality, and that functionality is provided to you at runtime, uh, basically dynamic linking that functionality. So you can think of this as having a set of modules that act as a standard libraries um, at the WebAssembly layer, and then any WebAssembly program that requests this functionality is going to uh, have access to it. So you can think of this, uh, the perfect mental model for this would be like when you request something from the operating system. You expect it to be there because the operating system can be seen as a platform um, for, for uh, running programs too. So here is where um, concepts from the component model start making sense to us uh, for, for our use case. If you have questions about the component model, don't ask me, ask Luke. Uh, so yeah, you might be able to answer better. Uh, but I, I want to highlight three main pillars of the component model that are crucial to enable this composition of programs. And they are module linking, the canonical ABI, and interface types. So I'm going to start with module linking. Um, and the idea here is that you can link modules at runtime without having to write glue code on your host. So your API, your runtime needs to provide a native API uh, to allow you to do this. And then we have interface types, um, which are types that describe high-level high values. So as, as some of you might know, WebAssembly right now only supports uh, low-level values that are basically ints, floats. Um, and so with this proposal, we can have access to high-level values like a string. Um, and then we have the canonical ABI, which is pretty important to what we're doing because it describes a relationship between a high-level value and a core WebAssembly value. So how do I go from um, an N32 to, an, to, to a string or, you know, or the other way around? So um, that's important. Now, I don't want to get too theoretical here, um, but I want to do touch into a practical use case. So let's assume that the user-defined functions that you're accepting in your platform need access to a date formatting library, right? Your users need, for some reason, to format some, some dates. Um, so I've, I've created this repository, which you can visit, where I have all the code for this, uh, for this presentation. Um, and first, I want to visit the static linking approach. So how you would do this if you wanted to create a single program that is going to run and is going to format some, some dates, right? So the main thing that you would do, for example, is have a project that looks like this. Um, you will have an index.js, and then you would have um, a package.json that will look like this, and potentially you would import a date formatting library from, a, from your, you know, the NPM ecosystem. So this, this date formatting library is going to take two, two, two strings and give you a formatted string in, in human form, depending on you know, the lengths of, of, of those dates. Um, and in your build process, you're going to use a tool like Javi, for example, pass it in uh, your JavaScript, and then get a final WebAssembly module. And your code probably is going to look something like this. Um, when you uh, run npm run build, you're going to invoke Webpack or whatever build tool you use and execute Javi to get your final WebAssembly. Now, I have an entry in my make file in that project that executes that, and I want to execute that here. So, um, just one second. So I have my terminal, hope it's big enough. So if I, if I um, execute, sorry, make, make a standalone, that's gonna invoke was some time and then we get um, about one year, right? Which is what, what we were expecting. Now, that's the, 
easy use case. Now let's go to the dynamic linking approach. The first thing that we wanna do since the date formatting functionality is what's common um, for all the user defined functions is factor out the common functionality, right? Um, and that basically means um, that we are going to have um, some JavaScript that is going to request that date functionality and we want to um, link it against a, a performant uh, date library which is going to be written in Rust. So we create a crate that is going to look like this um, and then we have our code uh, to do that. The important part here is the top level part. So we are using, uh, here I'm using a tool called WidBinding, which is a binding generator for interface types. This basically takes in an interface definition and creates the, the code that you need uh, to go from high level types to low level types and then from low level types to high level types. So that process is called lifting and lowering. Um, and that file looks like this, right? And then Rust, um, the WidBinding tool for Rust expects us to fulfill uh, this contract by implementing a trait. Um, and the trait implementation basically looks like this, right? It, you get two dates and you pull in um, chrono and chrono humanize, which are uh, Rust's libraries, which will be the equivalent for our JavaScript dependency, and then you execute that on top. When we compile this to WASM3 to WASI, we get um, the following export. So we export a function called format um, that is going to be, you know, is in low level types is going to receive four params, which represent two strings, and then gives us um, another pointer. So up until now, we have extracted the common functionality that we want to link at runtime. Now we need to implement the consumer module. For us to implement the consumer module in JavaScript, we need to create bindings um, for our JavaScript runtime. In this case, I'm using QuickJS. So the idea is that I'm going to let the JavaScript runtime, QuickJS, know that at some point in the future, this functionality is going to be present. Um, and the usage is going to be like this. Um, I'm going to have, in the global, um, access to a, an object called date and to a key that is going to be called format that is going to represent a function. And then, in the last line, um, I'm going to call uh, format difference and I'm going to pass two strings. Keep in mind that these two strings are high-level JavaScript values that we are going to um, need later on. Uh, so that's the important part. And the way this is done in QuickJS or in Java's code base is just creating a callback um, that is going to um, you know, be a function that is going to look like this in terms of Rust. But the important part here is how this is implemented. So the important part here is the extern block that we have at the top that it's uh, instructing that we are expecting this functionality to be available s somewhere in the future. Um, this functionality though is represented in low level WebAssembly types. Um, so in this callback, we get access to two JavaScript strings that we want to lower into pointers to pass in to the function that is defined in that extern C block. Once we um, convert those two values, those two JavaScript strings into pointers in the process that's called lowering, uh, we can call that, that, um, that function. One thing to notice though is that we have uh, five um, params here because um, in the last param, it's something that we call the return pointer area in which we're going to encode what that function is returning. Basically the length of um, up, up until where we can read memory and the pointer. Um, so this is, I think this has been standardized in the canonical uh, ABI. And then the last part that we do here is basically from that return area pointer, we read uh, that specific memory and then we create a JavaScript string. So this is the process that's called lifting. Uh, so we return this string to the user and then we can have access to that functionality. Um, when we compile this to WebAssembly, we can see that we have an import that's called date, um, has a key format, and has a function of, of the type that um, we defined earlier with uh, the five parameters. Now, we have the consumer module and we have the producer module, or the API. And one export looks like this, and the other import look like, looks like the following. We can see that these signatures don't necessarily match, and here is where we need to introduce something else, like adapting the functions between the two modules to be, for them to, to communicate uh, effectively. And here is where we started using a, a tool called WASMLink, um, and Radu, who was here, uh, has written a blog post, so if you don't know how this works, 
uh, you can uh, read the, the blog there and it might give you um, more insight. So the idea behind Wasm Link is that you give a Wasm Link a consumer module like our JavaScript module, uh, a set of interface types, and then another implementation of the date of, of the module that, that it's exporting the functionality that you want, and then it creates a statically linked module that contains all that functionality and both modules communicating together. The, I had to modify a Wasm Link because if I kept it the way it was, it was counterintuitive to the size benefits that we can get by dynamically linking at runtime. So in my modification, um, you give Wasm Link a consumer module and just the interface types definitions of the modules that you want to consume. This gives us a final module that is thinner and it's smaller and, and you know, it doesn't require the code of um, all the other modules that this module is trying to communicate with. So the way I invoke this is just Wasm Link, I give it the consumer module, and then um, I get, uh, you know, the, the result is a module that looks like this. So at the top, we have uh, a type of an instance, which is uh, a concept introduced by the, I'm not sure if to say deprecated, but uh, module linking proposal. And then the important part is the last line in which we import a date as an instance, as it was defined above, and then that instance is required to export the format functionality and some other functions to be able to allocate and free memory from, uh, from this module. So uh, yeah, this is what I was explaining before. And well, we have uh, the two pieces now. Uh, we have the consumer module and the producer one, and we have adapted the modules between the calls between those two modules. How do we uh, do this in the host? Well, uh, here I have a wrapper around Wasm time, uh, which I'm, I'm, you know, I, I created sort of like a STD API in which we load the date functionality that we want. We instantiate that standard library piece, and then we create a guest module from the one that was given to us from the command line. Uh, and then we create an instance and grab the start function and we execute that. So the important part here is the instantiate STD part, which basically looks like this. So was time up until uh, version .35.3 uh, provided a way to instantiate a module and then registering that instance as an instance that would be resolved if someone else asked for it. So in our case, uh, if our JavaScript module asks for an instance, that we registered, Wasm time will be able to resolve that. So I have, again, in my make file, um, a shared uh, implementation, which is going to run our host crate and pass in the dynamic loading WebAssembly module. So let's take a look at that. To be able to run that, it's going to take some time to compile. and then we get the, the same functionality that we had um, with JavaScript. All right, so let's go to some statistics. Um, in the static version, we have um, a binary size of 2.2 megabytes. Let's keep in mind that we are embedding a JavaScript engine and we have a performance of around 323 microseconds. Now, in the dynamic approach, we have a size of 900 kilobytes and a performance of 106, 160 microseconds. So this means that, in general, we have saved 50% uh, in both size and performance by going through a dy dynamic link approach. So just to do a recap, we have, done, uh, we have gotten gains in performance and in code size, and we have also, um, enable composability at the runtime layer, right? And the other advantage of this approach is that everything is WASM-based. Um, if you have a platform in which you have the, uh, developers submitting, um, you know, third-party developers submitting user-defined functions and then first-party developers enabling those APIs, you certainly want uh, to have that functionality sandboxed because you could do some of this in the host too, uh, but you're getting out of the sandbox at that point. Now. Let's see some of the cons uh, that we have seen so far. So the first one is debuggability. When you have a composition um, and, we are, and when you're dealing with uh, multiple binaries compiled by different tool chains, the debuggability story is not 
fully sorted out. So that has been a challenge for us. And then the other uh, piece is memory consumption. So the approach that I've uh, shown here is something um, that's called a shared nothing approach in which, e in which each module uh, keeps access to its own memory. And so if you have multiple of this, you would have uh, this, like in this, in this graph, for example, here in this diagram, we have eight modules, you would have at least eight linear memories. So that means that your memory consumption can go up depending on how you architect this. Um, yeah, so that's everything that I have. I would say that this is uh, highly experimental. All the tools are changing, uh, but this has been something that has proven to be very useful for our use case in which we want to keep performance under control and also module size under control. So this is my GitHub and Twitter handle in case you want to reach out or take a look at any of the code that I've shown here. Thanks.